Hello! For December 2023, I'm focusing on Christmas carols that I haven't heard before or haven't heard often. A quick reminder, if you need instructions for how these videos work, there's a free download on my website. For today's song, I'm thinking about verse 2 of Thou Who Wast Rich Beyond All Splendor. The words are written by Frank Houghton. I hope I pronounced his last name correctly. I suspect that if any of you are from churches that sing hymns, you might have encountered this song. It also looks like the Gettys recorded it, so maybe you heard it from them. This is another Christian song by a British minister. My understanding is that he was Anglican and also a missionary to China in the early 20th century. Not necessarily relevant to the discussion, but interesting. I found the lyrics to three verses really easily with an internet search, but I'll go ahead and read verse two here, and then you can look up the lyrics to reference later. Here's verse two. Thou who art God beyond all praising, all for love's sake becamest a man. Stooping so low, but sinners raising heavenwards by thine eternal plan. Thou who art God beyond all praising, all for love's sake becamest a man. I really should pick easier song verses to talk about. The more I read these lyrics, the more I think of complex theological topics like what heaven is, or are humans always sinners? Those topics are too big for a short study. I'll try to keep the questions interesting and manageable. Let's see how I do. Scripture references to get the discussion going are on the next slide. You can pause now if you'd like to look them up. The first line of this verse is interesting because it says that God is beyond praise. I'll save my thoughts until you think about the first question. What does it mean that God is beyond all praising? Keep in mind that song lyrics are poetry. Pause the video now. What ideas came up in your discussion? If you'd like to share, leave a comment. When I first read this line, I had two thoughts almost simultaneously. The lyric is attempting to express how much greater God is than humans are and... Christians really like to think of themselves as incapable of adequately worshiping God. Coming from a Christian tradition that teaches that a human is being made holy like Christ is holy, sanctification, and that when God looks at those who have chosen to follow Christ, God sees Christ, not the human, I find this I'm not good enough attitude perplexing. I could see it making sense from a tradition that teaches that even those who are forgiven followers of Christ are still just poor sinners, but I hear this not good enough idea in other types of traditions. It doesn't make sense to me how those two things are believed to be true at the same time. And I do understand that song lyrics are poetry and potentially the songwriter is trying to express the differences between God and a human. But still, if you sing this song in a church without any discussion of the meaning, it's possible that people will think you're teaching them that the praise they offer God isn't good enough for God. In the Old Testament, God gave specific directions to the Israelites on how to worship Yahweh. Why would God give specific directions if humans were incapable of praising God in a way that pleases God? And think about Genesis. God created humans, saw what was made, and called it good. If a Christian believes that Christ destroyed the power of sin over humanity, why do we think that, as a Christian, 
the way we praise God isn't enough to please God. Of course, yeah, we have to be humble before God, but God made us and gave us our abilities. When we moan about how we and our abilities aren't good enough for God, how is that not denigrating what God made and called good? I'm not saying to be arrogant and act like your praise is so good that God has no choice but to accept it. I'm saying that only God can decide if our expressions of praise are good enough for him. I'm sure I'm missing something here because I really don't like whiny Christianity and that's biasing my view of the topic. I also wonder if this is one of those times when a Christian has to be comfortable with paradox. But at the same time, this could have serious consequences. If humans are so incapable of praising God sufficiently, if God is so beyond our ability to praise rightly, then why do we even bother? Hey, God wants you to do this thing, but you're always going to fail. Who wants to take part in that? I thought I had something useful to say about this lyric. Something about the majesty and awesomeness of God. But I've lost it. Let's go on to the next question. How is Jesus becoming human in act of love? Pause the video now. If you've been a Christian for more than five minutes, I think that was probably a straightforward question, but it can be useful for us to practice putting into words concepts we believe. For more of a challenge, try to think if there are ways that Jesus becoming human could be considered not loving. I'm not saying that's true. I'm suggesting that thinking of things from a different perspective can help us to understand the concept better. Here's the next question. What is eternity? How does your church define eternity? What time periods do you think of as eternity? Pause the video and to define eternity. Welcome back. In my experience, when Christians talk about eternity, they are thinking about a far distant time after Christ's second coming or a time after each person's death. But those definitions have a specific starting point. Does eternity have a defined start? If eternity neither starts nor ends, but simply is, then wouldn't we be living in part of eternity right now? If we are living in a part of eternity, then what does a Christian mean when they talk about eternity? Eternal life usually means immortality of some type. But what do you mean when you talk about eternity as a time concept in Christianity? If we think of eternity as something separate from our lives as we experience them now, then we will live differently than if we think of our lives now as part of eternity. I've already talked a lot in this video, so I won't get into that idea here. It's something for you to think about on your own. This is the last question. What value is there in using hymns with old-fashioned language? Pause the video now. I hope as you thought through that last question, you thought about ways that using historical creations can highlight the connection Christians today have to those in different times and places. Maybe you thought about ways to help people understand the old-fashioned language. Maybe you found an appreciation for the poetic beauty or references to scripture or church history that can be found in older songs. And if you think that there is no value to using songs with outdated language or that the downsides are greater than the benefits, please leave a comment with your reasoning. Also, if there is a less popular Christmas carol that you like, 
please share it in the comments. Merry Christmas. Remember, transcripts can be found on my website. The link is in the channel info. Also, if you've watched this far, please subscribe. I'd like to publish a book that goes into more detail and looks at full songs, but agents for nonfiction Christian books won't accept submissions unless the author has a large social media following. So please help me and subscribe. Thanks.